Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're going to get into Extra History's D-Day series. This is part one, The Great Crusade. Let's get into it. When the signal is given, the whole circle of avenging nations will hurl themselves upon the foe and batter out the life of the cruelest tyranny which has ever sought to bar the progress of mankind. That signal comes today. Real quick, Winston Churchill's World War II speeches are literally just some of the best speeches ever uh, in world history. You know, obviously, film and radio and stuff hasn't been a around for a super long time, but man, Winston Churchill's are good from World War II. This episode is sponsored by Wargaming. New players can download World of Tanks and use the code NEPTUNE for free goodies. Link in the description. D-Day, June 6th, 1944. Months of effort have been building up to this day. Throughout England, half a million men have been gathered at staging areas to strike across the channel as soon as the signal is given. Men from the United States, Britain, Canada, Australia, Belgium, Czechoslovakia, France, Greece, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, and Poland. Today, we'll be telling the American story, as best it can be told in a few short minutes, and over the coming weeks, thanks to the generous support of Wargaming, we will tell the story of three of the other major players involved. But that story begins with a dinner in Tehran in 1943. For the first time, the leaders of the most powerful allied nations, the United States, the USSR, and the British Empire, met in one room. For years, Stalin, his nation battered by the Nazi invasion and bearing the brunt of the human cost of the war against Germany, had pressed the Allies to open up a second front to the war by invading France. The British had pushed back, arguing for operations in North Africa, and then an assault on Italy. But now, with the USSR winning on the Eastern Front, the demands from Stalin became harder to deny, and simultaneously, everyone started to think of the post-war settlement. If the Allies won without British and American troops liberating Western Europe, how could they stop the USSR from claiming huge swaths of land, and perhaps even, at least politically, dominating the continent? And so an agreement was made out in the deserts of Iran. The Western powers would open up a second front by invading France in May of 1944. Plans... Okay, so that idea, that thought process of once the Soviets tur turn the direction of the war in the East, it puts even more pressure on the Allies in the West to, to bust a move, right? They've been holding off and holding off and kind of slow playing what Stalin wants them to do, which is open up a full Western front. Um, but once the direction of the war turns in the East, you have, and, and I've talked about this before, but at least with American political and military leaders, you have people in positions of power at this moment, that view the USSR as much of a threat as they do Nazi Germany, if not more so, just because of the size and resources that the Soviet Union is now putting to work fighting the war in the East, right? So there are a lot of people in positions of power in the US that they have their eyes squarely set on what the post-war world looks like and they are they are completely um, uncomfortable with the idea that the Soviet unions are going to dominate Europe they are not about to let that happen so it puts a lot of pressure on them to get involved in the war in a real way with boots on the ground as quickly as possible were drawn up an amphibious operation of this size had never been tried Men and material would have to be drawn back from around the world. New technologies would have to be invented. Engineering feats previously only discussed in conference rooms would have to be put to the test under wartime conditions. But the first decision that had to be made was where to land. There were two possible targets. Calais, the closest point in Europe to England, or Normandy, one of the farthest on the Channel Coast. 
Calais was the sane, sensible place to land, but it had two notable disadvantages. First, terrain in which you could easily get bogged down, and second, the fact that it was the sane, sensible place to land. Reviewing the battle plan, Eisenhower and Montgomery were in agreement. They wanted the element of surprise, with the possibility of being able to rush off the beaches. So the decision was made. Normandy, it would be. But and they actually go about uh, maintaining that surprise and the illusion of the Pas de Calais being the landing zone brilliantly. Brilliantly. British intelligence really, really outdoes themselves with the lead up to the Normandy landings. But this would require one of the greatest counterintelligence operations ever attempted to keep the secrets safe, not to mention the equipment and the manpower on an even greater scale. Entire harbors had to be fabricated which could be shipped over from England. More landing craft needed time to roll off the factory lines, so the operation was delayed until June. Finally, the day arrives. June 4th, 1944. Planes prep, Final drills are run through, tens of thousands of men board ships for the invasion, and then the rain starts to roll in. Soon it becomes a storm. Ferocious waves sweep the channel. Clouds completely block the sky. High winds. What? Rain and storms in Britain? Who, who could have possibly predicted that? Winds buffet any craft that ventures on sea, land, and especially air. Eisenhower is forced to make the decision. The attack must be delayed. Rain continues to pour the next day. A council of allied commanders is called. If they delay again, they won't be able to launch until July. They need to do the channel crossing at night. They need to do commando raids and mine sweeping when the unsuspecting Germans will have the fewest patrols out. But for a crossing of this magnitude, they need nearly full moon visibility. Even if they did decide to brave a launch without the full moon, tidal conditions wouldn't be right for another two weeks. What do they do? They've got thousands of men already holed up on boats, getting seasick and nervous and just plain stir-crazy. They've already started moving equipment and forces into staging areas which can clearly only be targeting one place, Normandy. And they've had to alert enough people up and down the chain as to the nature of the operation that, with each passing day, the odds of keeping their landing location a secret plummet. But to cross in this weather? That would be madness. Then a captain is ushered in. He's an RAF meteorologist, and he is about to make what may well be the most consequential weather report of all time. He says he believes it's going to be clear on the 6th. Eisenhower nods. The operation is a go. 6,000 ships begin to steam across the channel. Minesweepers fan out ahead of them, clearing a path. For weeks, the Allied forces have bombed the German Air Force in the region nearly to oblivion. No enemy interceptors exist to spot the waves of gliders and transport planes carrying 17,000 airborne troops. The ships won't reach the beaches until dawn, but the airborne infantry has night work to do. First in are the Pathfinders, the men whose job it is to light the drop zones for all the other parachute infantry. Of the four planes carrying these Pathfinders, one overshoots their target, another has to bail before ever getting to France, and the remaining two kept most of their signaling gear in the ditched plane, leaving them desperately trying to signal the paratroopers by waving flashlights at the passing airplanes. The paratrooper drop goes even worse. Scattered by enemy anti-aircraft fire and blinded by low clouds, paratroopers jump from altitudes that are either too high, leaving them drifting slowly, unable to do anything but watch as enemy guns spit shrapnel up at them, or too low, breaking bones on landing as their parachutes don't have enough time to slow their fall. They're scattered all over, many of them landing miles from their drop zones, some landing in marshes or rivers, others being slaughtered as they drop right into the middle of the enemy. It was a harrowing and confusing night of chaotic firefights and desperate small unit actions. But the- This is not completely uncommon for World War II, right? This is a time period where Technology is increasing exponentially, but it hasn't been increasing exponentially for so long that everybody kind of has the hang of it. So you have new technology, uh, which brings on new ideas and theories, and, and so you everything changes very, very quickly. It leads to a lot of chaos in a lot of different situations in World War II, 
you have bombings that go through that aren't supposed to happen and advances that are mistakes and it's this is not uncommon but because of what they're up against with the landings because the fate of the western front really is tied to whether or not this is successful it becomes a much bigger deal on this scale the more veteran of the American airborne troops, groups like the Screaming Eagles and the 505th, managed to pull together to capture crucial road badasses, junctions, communication points, and bridges, and even destroyed some of the artillery batteries that would imperil the landing at Normandy. And they would hold fast, delaying or preventing any counterattack that might sweep the impending invasion back into the sea. Then there's the initial bombardment. Allied bombing runs go astray, causing massive damage to the civilian centers in Normandy, but doing little to weaken the dug-in German positions. As dawn breaks, though, the Allied gunners can finally see their targets, and the bombardment becomes far more effective, softening up the beach for the initial assault. But there's little time remaining until the troops' scheduled landing. At 6.30 a.m. on June 6, 1944, the klaxons sound, and the assault craft are released. They plow through the chop, men huddled in their tin shells as German fire pours down, sinking entire landing craft to the bottom of the sea just off the Normandy coast. Then the assault craft hit the beach, ramps drop, and men charge out. But on Utah Beach, think- I would love to do- I'm working really hard on my- <laughs> getting my editing stuff figured out. I would love to do historical and war movies on the channel, and I have not seen the whole movie all the way through, but I have seen the clip of the landing a million times for Saving Private Ryan. And uh, Jocko Willink, who's an, an ex, uh, oh, he's a, a ex-Navy SEAL for, for the U.S. Navy, um, talks about how that is one of the most realistic wartime scenario scenes um, that he's ever seen ever and it's of this exact moment it's of the exact moment where the landing crafts go out the doors roll down and troops are running onto the beach trying not to get shot it's a really brutal situation things have already gone horribly the men look around them and the terrain's all wrong. They've landed on the wrong beach. Luckily for the Americans, the oldest man in the invasion and the only general to actually join these ground troops, Teddy Roosevelt Jr., happens to have landed with them. The local commanders ask him what they should do, and living up to his namesake, he simply responds, We'll start the war from right here. He correctly assessed that the beach that they'd landed on was actually a better, more easily takeable landing point than the one that the senior staff had assigned them. In a miracle of heroism and logistical coordination, he managed to reroute the entire Utah Beach invasion force to his location, direct the battle, and continuously rally the men as he walked the beach with his cane, waving his pistol. His new Utah Beach would be the first beach... And if I'm not... Oh yeah, it says it there at the bottom. That's what I was going to say. If I'm not mistaken, I think he dies shortly after this. So he has this huge super important moment and show of, of heroism. And he has all of these health issues that he has pushed to the back burner and not been forthcoming about because he wants to be in the group that lands. He, he does everything he can. Um, he helps so much in the Utah landings. And then it's like, all right, I did my job and then dies after that successfully overrun, and for his actions there, he would be awarded the Medal of Honor. Omaha, though, was a different story. Here, the pre-landing bombardment had been even less effective. The seas were choppy, landing craft took on water, and men tried to bail with their helmets. Some of the landing craft sank, and those that landed were filled with retching, seasick men. Much of the armored support that was supposed to follow them foundered in the waves, or simply got picked off as they hit the shore. Soon, the men were all pinned down against a small shingle of land that provided what little cover there was to be found on the beach. Many of the units had taken heavy casualties, and much of the command staff was dead. With units getting washed ashore in the wrong places, or scattered in the desperate scramble to try to get to the small ridge of sand that served as cover, the assault had become hopelessly disorganized. 
The second wave met with much the same fate. Hopelessly bogged down, withdrawal from Omaha Beach was considered, but it was the vital linking point between the British and American forces. As the day wore on, a number of Ranger units began to rally and scaled the bluffs, finally managing to assault German positions on the heights. At the same time, several of the naval ships came dangerously close to the beach to provide more effective support fire just as the German ammunition began to run out. Even after all of this, Omaha Beach wasn't truly cleared by the end of the 6th. But as the sun began to set on those bloodied beaches, it was clear that the American forces were there to stay. Join us next time as we join the British for their covert efforts to keep the biggest invasion in history a secret. Oh, that's awesome. That story is so great. It's like a, a spy thriller on how the British intelligence keeps, keeps everything under wraps. Um, okay, so that was part one for Extra History's D-Day series. Uh, like, comment, subscribe. Help me keep building the channel over here. And I will see all of you next time.